because we just don't have the time in this class to talk about it. But if you're interested in that, I don't know when I'm teaching it again, probably in, uh, well, our, our four-year cycle starts, year one starts this fall. And so you can jump in there. Um, but I don't remember off the, off the calendar when, when I would teach the, the, full, the full load of everything. Uh, but anyway, let me just say this about the Bible. There's many subjects that create discussion, cause debate, and sometimes division in the body of Christ. Uh, doctrine and debate can be handled. You can open up the Bible and you can study out doctrine. You can look at, at um, getting the, that, that straightened out. Even division can be sorted out in the Bible. But what do you do about the division when the division is the Word of God? Which Bible should you use? I don't know if you know how many Bibles there are, but there's probably 50 to 75 different, just in the English language, versions of the Bible that you can go to a bookstore and buy. That many of them. Um, and so what we're going to start tonight, as I said, is what I call both the history and the heritage of the Bible. And just as often, I just normally refer to it very simply as manuscript evidence. And what is the evidence that this is the manuscript that God wants you to use and God wants every church to use? And we're going to talk about that. So the Bible, or this book that we call a Bible, is more than a collection of quaint stories, which a lot of people like to accuse the Bible of being quaint stories and moral stories and things like that. It's a lot more than that. It is actually the mind of God. We start with that precedent. We'll talk about precedents here shortly, but let me just go on. So um, the book that they call the Bible is a collection more than that. We have to be able to stand on solid ground and not sinking sand. And we cannot weather any storm in the, in the church if we cannot count on the captain of our soul to give us safety uh, through any storm that we, get, that we face ourselves with. If you don't know that the Bible is true, how are you going to know that God is true? Because the closest you're going to get to God in this lifetime is this book. I mean, you know, the only time you're going to see God is when you're in another, language, another world, a new, an, an eternal world. So we're not going to be able to see God right now. But you, the closest you get to God is this book right now. So we have to know that we have to be assured that our faith uh, is, can be traced out through this word and can be proven in the word. Why do we have the faith that we have? Why do we believe the things that we believe? And so um, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're not going to turn there, but he wrote and challenged the church to realize that if Christ had not resurrected, and it's an interesting how he said that. He said, if Christ be not resurrected, then we're basically all dead. We're not resurrected we're ourselves. We're not, we don't live eternal. We don't have eternal life. We're, we're just dead if Christ never, if he hasn't resurrected. That's actually in verses 12 to 19, if you want to just make a note of that. And so we're glad that we're going to embark on this uh, three to four weeks. I say three to four weeks because it just depends on how fast I can talk, how much I can get it in. Now, I may, uh, if we have questions, you're welcome to ask questions anytime. I may not be able to answer every question, but I will try. If I can't, I'll get an answer for you for the next class. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to look at the basics of our confidence in the Word of God. So basically what we got, so, so, the, so tonight we're going to just do an introduction and in how you should view your Bible. Just what, when you look at a Bible, what should you think about when it comes to a Bible? I don't know how you approach your Bible. I don't know what you think about your Bible. Uh, I think about it as the Word of God, the mind of God, and especially if I want to have a relationship with Him, that's where I go to, is to the Bible. We're also going to talk about uh, what, what I would call the, the doctrine of, the, of preservation, uh, because the Bible has been preserved. The question is, where is it preserved at? And so we're going to talk about that <clears throat> in probably starting next week. And then um, the last week and maybe the last two weeks, we're going to be talking about what I call faulty texts. So we're going to do some comparison, verses, comparison, uh, we're going to look at why we have faulty Bibles out there. How did they get there? What value do they have, if any at all? And how you can compare this book, the King James Bible, to those Bibles and know which one you need to go to. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, so let me start with this. And so um, I've got a PowerPoint. I, I think it's going to work. Um, I'm going to advance it every so often. There's blanks in your notes. 
you can fill and it just kind of helps you keep track of where I'm at. If you, and I told everybody, if you're not in D2, it looks like everybody already figured out that there's handouts out on the connections counter uh, that you can get those. And I apologize for my voice. Uh, it's been like this for the last four or five days. I'm not sick. I, I don't know what the problem is. I don't have COVID. I've been tested and I don't have a temperature, don't have a fever. I just sound bad. So just have to excuse that and just put up with it the best you can. <clears throat> and uh, we'll get through this. Okay, so introduce, introduction of the Bible. So the term the Bible, the, the term the Holy Bible, um, is, is used for the Christian scriptures because it's the book by way of preeminence. And that word preeminence is very important. It's, it's, preeminent means in the front, up front, top, number one, the, 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 prim, the primary important book. Um, so we're not, and we're not talking about at this point which book, but the Bible is important to every person's life. It should have preeminence in your life, and your life should be, mag should be uh, orchestrated according to what the Bible has to say. So the Greek word uh, for, uh, for the Bible is the word biblios, and um, it refers to, actually the word biblios so we know it is a Bible, but the, word, the, the origination of the word biblios, it came from the cellular part of the stem of the papyrus reed. So the Bible came from, they, they actually, in Egyptian um, history, they took the papyrus plant and they dried it out. They took the fibers and they weaved it together and they made a sheet of paper out of it. And so that's, so that's where we get the term Bible it's, it's that fiber, it's that, it's that content of the, of the, uh, the papyrus uh, reed. Uh, and uh, so it's used several times in the Bible. In fact, if I've got up, I don't know if you can read it very well, but in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read, and there was delivered unto him the book. That word book right there is the Greek word biblios. So, so Jesus was handed the Bible. It was the text uh, in, a, in a roll form, in a, in a scroll. Uh, and that fibrous roll material was rolled up. Uh, as, and so he started in the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book or the biblios, he found the place where it was written. And then he began to read. So two times in verse 17, you can see the word book. And Luke originally wrote his gospel in Greek, and so uh, some claim that he wrote in Aramaic, but we don't have to. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have it to prove. So far, practical reasons say he wrote it in Greek. I mean, there are always people are always trying to attack who wrote it, what language did they use, what words should they have used. We'll talk about what's and later on what's called textual and form criticism. Key on the word criticism. Uh, they criticize the Bible by the text that is there. Oh, no, he shouldn't have used the word book. He should have used a different word. Well, this is what we have, so we're going to go with this. Um, and like I said, some claim that he wrote in Arabic, uh, but everybody in, the, in, in uh, the Middle East at the time spoke Greek because that was the language of trade that was the language of everything. Everybody spoke Greek. They might have spoken other languages, but they, still, they did speak Greek. Uh, 100 and, uh, 1,100 years before Christ, the Egyptians discovered that process, as I was describing, of stretching and weaving the strips of the papyrus reed until they could put it together as a scroll, a rolled up sheet. I mean, it would be, well, if you've ever seen um, I don't remember how many years ago, four or five years ago, there was a display at the uh, um, Union Station, and they had the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls there. Did anybody go see that? That was a pretty cool thing. They had the, they had an, a, a, it wasn't the actual real one, but they had a, a display of the book of Isaiah rolled out on, this, on, an, on the wall. It, it was 30-something feet long. It was incredible. And, it's all, and of course, you got the big wooden rolls that they would roll it up in and uh and so you could see that and that's kind of how they did it that's all of that was was weaved together with the with the the fibers of that plant called the papyrus plant which grows along the nile river and other places 
Um, and so they use that to uh, put together a scroll. So a papyrus scroll, so the, uh, the word biblios is that fiber, but the word biblion, which is not a, not a blank for you or anything, but the word biblion is, uh, is, the, is referred to as the scroll. So he was, he, was, he was presented with the Bible. He opened it up. He read the, off of that. And so a papyrus scroll called a, called a biblion, and early in the second century A.D., Christians adopted the word Bible and began to use it in reference to the scriptures. So that's, where the, that's how we got to the word Bible. Where did the word Bible come from? It came from that fiber. They called it Bible or Biblios in Greek. Uh, and so that's where they wrote the words of God. They copied them onto that. So, hey, give me the Bible. And give me a scroll. So give me a Bible. Give me the signatures. And you have the whole book. Okay, so the Bible, as I said earlier, is the, is the written revelation of God, or the mind of God. It's the written revelation of the mind of God. And we know that God's mind only from God's word, because you've never met God. But the only way we can know that this is God's mind is because of what he says in, in the word. And so in 1 Corinthians 2.16, it's, it's on the screen. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him, or that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So you want to know what Christ thinks about things? You want to know what God thinks about things? You have to open up the Bible to find out what God says about things. I mean, we don't get to make this stuff up. If we're not, if Pastor Brian on Sunday mornings, if he's not preaching from this book, then he's just telling you his own mind. And we don't want that. I mean, you know, sometimes he might say, this is my opinion. And you know, that's just his word. But we want this word preached all the time as much as possible. Um, and so communication is a key to everything that goes on in the world. Communication is a key. Uh, and the Holy Spirit has communicated the mind of God in word packages. I don't know if you ever think about it. Each verse is a word package. Some of those verses are packed with a lot of information. You ever notice how Brian can be on one verse for two weeks? Because there's a lot there in that one verse. That's why he does that, because he's unpacking the word package to lay it all out for us. And so that makes it not my or, or his or the scholar's opinion, but it makes it the Holy Spirit's own conclusion. Um, in fact, I don't have it listed in my notes, but let me just turn to a passage here real quick. I think it's in John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verse 13 says, Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. Holy Spirit is going to show you through the word of God that this is God's word. And you can count on it being as God's word because the Holy Spirit is talking to you about this is the word. And that's what we're, that's what we're defining there. And so anyway, um, so we're not looking at my opinion. We're not looking at Brian's opinion. We're not looking at any scholar's opinions. We're looking at what the Holy Spirit says about the Word of God. So that makes it not mine or, or anybody else's. It makes it his. So there's an eternal nature in the Bible. Um, I know it's on paper, and paper can burn and all that kind of stuff. And we can, you know, my Bible has been destroyed and recovered a couple times. And, you know, it gets destroyed because I, I'm pretty rough on him. But anyway, the eternal nature of the Bible... Uh, the nature of the Bible as a historic document details God dealing with a called out people group. So both in the Old Testament, there's a called out people group and in the New Testament, there's a called out people group. In the Old Testament, it's Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. So he's dealing with called out people group. The eternal, uh, the eternal nature of the Bible declares his covenant promise between God and the men and women he created. So we're not going to talk about the covenant promises in this, in this section. Uh, that's another whole class in D2. I think it's in D2, but if it's not, I know it's in the Bible Institute where we get into the covenant promises. So as we have it now, the way we have it right now, the Bible consists of two parts. I think everybody knows, right? There's at least two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. How many books are there in the, in the Bible? Anybody know how many books there are? 
66, right. There are 66 books in the Bible. How many in the Old Testament? 39. How many in the New Testament? Quick math, 27. <laughs> okay, okay, so the, the Latin word testimum, the Latin word testimum was a translation of the Greek word for covenant. So when we say that something like uh, the New Testament or the Old Testament, we're talking about the new or the old covenant that God has promised. There's an old covenant that God made through Moses and a new covenant that God promised when he, while talking to Jeremiah. And then that new covenant he gets brought forward into the church. The nature of these two covenants is chronicled in the pages of the Bible. That's what the Bible is all about. The Bible covers all of that information about what God's promise is and how he's working out his promise. So he starts off, and actually his promise started in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, talking about Christ. And then it gets expanded in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. And then there's five other places throughout the book of Genesis alone where that promise is expanded and explained again over and over again to make sure that the people didn't know what, know what God's promise is. And then the Old Testament is God working out that promise and how Israel rejected the promise, unfortunately. And then we have the New Covenant, the New Testament, how God had made promises to you and to me as well. And we're working that out in the old, in, throughout the New Testament as well. So the Bible is a message from God to man that carries an agreement and stipulates the terms of the covenant made with, God, made with man. So it's basically God made a promise and this is how he's going to keep his promise. And so one of the things that you can, you know, you know that God made a promise to you because you have his Bible, you have his word, you have his mind. So it's important. Um, So there's five things I want to mention here real quick. I think it's five, maybe it's three. Anyway, we'll, we'll figure it out when I get the notes. Okay, the first thing to know about the Bible is the Bible is one book, even though there are 66 separate writings, uh, there are two pieces of evidence for this. First, it's consistent uh, from beginning to end. The, when you read it, you can tell that it's the same author. It's very easy to tell it's the same author because the author referred back to what he said before. He sometimes refers forward to what he's going to say. But that is what, how, that's why we cross-reference when we study the Bible. We have to cross-reference verses. The Bible is 66 books, separate writings, but it's consistent from the beginning to the end. There's an overall pattern that unifies all the separate parts into one symmetrical whole. And you see this when you do a Bible survey. Like when you start in Genesis and you work your way through it, you start seeing a pattern all the way through the Bible. You see a pattern going through. So it's, it says a progressive revelation as well. The term progressive revelation is important to understand. God, you know, sometimes you're like, well, why doesn't God just do what he's going to do? Well, because he's trying to reveal himself, but not all at once in a progressive pro model. He's progressively allowing you to see certain things. In other words, there's an unfolding of doctrine that progresses as you go through the books. Like, he doesn't really come directly out and say that Jesus Christ is going to be the, the, uh, the Lamb of God in Genesis chapter, uh, or in, in Exodus chapter 12. He doesn't say it, but he does say a lamb is going to die. And the people that sacrifice that lamb, if they're behind that blood, remember what this passage, right, in, in Exodus chapter 12, when Moses told the people to... to uh, to take a, 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 for, a young lamb, uh, kill it, put the blood on the doorpost and on the, the, man, the, what's it, the top piece and the two side pieces, and put that on there. Whoever's behind that blood will be saved. He doesn't talk about Jesus Christ there, but later on in John chapter, whatever chapter it is, when, G, when uh, John the Baptist says, behold, the what? Lamb. lamb of God. Now we can connect those two things and say, oh, that's what he was picturing and this is who he's picturing about. That's progressive revelation. Uh, and uh, and so, so the Bible gives us that progressive uh, process throughout the Bible. And topic after topic, you see doctrine progressively unfolded as you go from Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to backtrack. You don't have to break. It's all there. Other religious writings are what we would call an anthology. But the Bible is a book. 
It's not just a history book. It is the book, it's the mind of God. So let me give you a definition of anthology. Let's see, that's not up there. Well, hopefully it's in your notes. Is it in there? Nope. nope. Okay, well, it's not on the, hand, on the slide either. Anthology is a book or collection of selected writings by various authors, usually in the same literary form or the same period or in the same subject. The Bible is not that. It's, every book is a little bit different. Every book has a different authors, and they're talking about different things. They're not all talking about the same type of thing. Sorry that that isn't uh, in your notes, but it should have been. I have to make a note of that. Huh? Yep. Oh, I could type it up there, I would. But okay, anthology, a book that's an anthology is a book or a collection of selected writings by various authors, usually of the same literary form, of the same period of time. So let me, let me pick on a couple of statements there, or fragments there. First off, yes, it is by various writers. There was over 40 authors that wrote the Bible. They're all different, but they're not all from the same period of time. The authors of the Bible took, took almost 2,000 years to write the Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, all the way from Moses uh, up to uh, John, the Apostle John. They're totally different time frames, totally different uh, places. Their literary form is different. Um, the way that Paul writes is not the same way as Moses writes. The way that uh, uh, Isaiah wrote is not the same as Jeremiah wrote, and so on. So it's various authors using the same literary form of the same period or on the same subject. And each book of the Bible is not written on the same subject, but the subject is, is within the pages. The subject is Christ and God's promises to man, but that's not what they're all writing about. So does that help? Did you get that down? Okay. I can um, try to make sure. If you, don't, if you don't get it, I'll email it to you. Just let me know that you need it. Okay, number two, the second thing about the, about the Bible, it is a particular kind of book. It's not just an anthology. It's not just a writing about things. It's a different kind of book. It's a record. That record is, a, is really a duality. The Old Testament gives us a record of what of a called out nation, as I mentioned earlier, Israel concerning a physical seed taken from Abraham. That's the covenant based on the law of Moses. So the, the whole premise of the Old Testament is keeping the law. What is the law? Well, keep the law and so on. And the New Testament gives us a record of a called out people, the called out church concerning a spiritual seed taken from Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a covenant based on the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So the covenant before is in the law in the Old Testament. The covenant is through the blood of Christ in the New Testament. Number three, uh, the Bible is a particular kind of record because it's a divine revelation. It claims to be, and it seems to be, and it even proves itself to be a particular record by four pieces of evidence. So when you're looking for evidence on, what the, is the Bible really what we say it is? Here's four pieces of evidence that, that define it for what it is. The record is delivered as a revelation with divine authority. It's a revelation with divine authority. It's not only genuine as to its authorship, it's also authentic in all its claims, but it's absolutely authoritative. That word authoritative is important uh, because... Too many people don't want the authority of the Word of God. They don't want the authority of God, so they discount the Bible. That's the way you get rid of the authority of God, you get rid of the Bible. We'll talk more about authority uh, in, in the next couple sections in. So the, that revealed record, that revealed record tells us things that we could not know through any other means. We could not know. There's nothing else that can... Um, you could produce the history and, and uh, study it out. You couldn't get the same record that we get out of the Bible in any other way. And number four is a, is a, is a witness of it. Uh, is a revelation of God unfolded in hi history matching science. That's a key thing. The Bible matches science. The Bible doesn't uh, discount science. The Bible doesn't uh, submit to science. The Bible... 
uh, matches science with its accuracy. So, like creation and so on. Um, see, that was three. And then uh, number four is the Bible is a message of present salvation as the requirements for entrance into the future coming kingdom. The Bible has the message. How do you get saved? The Bible tells you how to get saved. You know, if you didn't have the Bible, you wouldn't know how to get saved. You would not know. So that's one of the things you cannot know without the Bible. How do you get saved? You cannot know that in any other, any other way unless somebody is telling you and referencing the Bible. That may, I mean, that's, you know, that's called witnessing. But the Bible is the only book that talks about how to know that you can be saved. If you want to know how you can get saved, you have to read the Bible. You have to, let me make sure I'm clear on that. The, you have to use the Bible to understand that you can, that's the only way you can get saved. Okay, so defining in the Bible a little bit. So what is, when I use the term manuscript evidence, what is manuscript evidence? And so there's a few things about it here. First off, it's the historical evidence recovered through various means that support the validity of the Bible as the written word. When I say evidence, I, think about that word evidence for a minute. I mean, we use, we use the word evidence a lot for a lot of different things. I need to see evidence. I need to see proof. So manuscript proof. This is what the Bible is, what it is, and I'm going to essentially prove to you why the Bible is what it is and why we've used the King James Bible in particular. Um, you know, I never really questioned that. I mean, the very first Bible I ever was given when I was a kid was a King James Bible. I didn't know that that's what it was supposed to be, but that's just what I had. So it's kind of like always been there. I remember when Julie was trying to get me to go to church, and I was a lost man, and I just hated going to church. And uh, the pastor at the church that we was going to was preaching out of, I don't know what he was using. So he wasn't the King James Bible, because he, he had a loner Bible, like we have Bibles under the pews here. Little, he had a loner Bible. It was a King James Bible. But he wasn't preaching out of that Bible. And I wouldn't get saved, because you give me a Bible, but you don't use it the one you're giving me to read out of. It kind of, I, I kind of felt insulted. Like, I'm not going to get saved. And I didn't get saved because he wasn't using the Bible that he wanted me to read. That's just an attitude I had. Fortunately, I got saved anyway. But anyway, the, the, so it's a historical evidence, historical proof. In particular, the evidence confirms, when we get to the confirming the evidence, it confirms that King James Bible is the correct Bible to be using. It's the only Bible that truly is God's Word. So there's seven interconnected key issues. We're not going to get in. This is what the, the HBI class will dig into in depth. But there's seven um, interconnected key issues that guide our examination of the evidence, each one building on the other till we arrive at a confirmation of the truth. Number one, how, do we, how does God give the Bible to you? How did he get the word to us? That is, that is what's called revelation. God revealed his word. Um, we surveyed this in, what, in this, well, you're not in this class. But this is just a note from HBI. But uh, in systematic theology is on the subject of bibliology. How do we explore all the details? Anyway, the point is, is how does God give us the word? He revealed his word. How did he do that? He, he moved. In fact, and we'll probably look at this again, but let's go to Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost communicated what to, what to write, and they wrote it down. That's where we get to that. That's the revelation part. Number two, comes right after revelation, would be what I call inspiration. How did it come to man? How did it come to man? Just what we just read, that passage that we just read there, it was uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's, that's a whole section on what we would call inspiration. The Word of God was inspired into the man who wrote it down. How exactly was it written down? The next, the next phase is called inscripturation. To inscripture it, to, to write it down. You know, when, um, uh, when you write a letter, does anybody actually write letters anymore? Maybe I know we send texts and we send, you send, okay, well, Pam does, a, Pam does that's good. But 
when you write it out by hand, that's, that's, you're inscripturating your thoughts on a paper. That's what it is. You're putting down your thoughts on paper. That's inscripturation. How exactly was it written? Number four is how it was transmitted. What happened to it through the centuries? How did we get from the first time that it was written down to now knowing what we have today is the correct what we have today? How do we know it's correct? God transmitted the word of God from one person to another. We will talk about, I'll give a, a, an example of how trans, trans, transmission worked. And then um, how do we know that we've got what we need? That's called preservation. So the question about preservation is really simple. It's a straightforward, simple question. Are you preserved? If you're saved, are you preserved? Absolutely. Well, what's the truth? What's, what, how do you know you're preserved? Because the word says you are. So if God can keep you saved from the time you got saved until the time you end your life on this earth, and then you go off into eternity and he keeps you in eternity, if he can keep you there, how come he can't keep his word preserved and protected? And when people say there's no way that God can preserve his word, we don't have his word preserved, then they're basically saying that God can't preserve your body, your soul, and keep you saved. And I totally disagree with that. Number six is translation. In what version is it found? So we have different versions, the King James Version, the New International Version, the, the uh, English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, but they don't use the word version in that, but there's, like I said, 75 or more actual versions of the Bible. You go to any bookstore that sells Bibles and you will find tons of them on the shelf. There are very common ones, but then there's a whole bunch that are not common. I got a list at home, I don't have it with me here, of uh, different Bibles. I'm like, I never even heard of these things. And number seven, is it possible to understand the Bible? That would be illumination. And yes, the question, the answer is yes the question, to the question, can the Bible be understood? Absolutely, it can be understood. You can be illuminated. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit will explain to you what, what the Word is saying. Now, no, no, there's not a person in the, in the church that can't teach at least a little bit about the Bible. You know, they can at least teach what Paul said about getting saved. Why? Because they got saved. So they should be able to de do that. So, so anybody can illuminate the, the, the Word of God. So now we're not, like I said, we're not going to go through all seven of these issues, and the ones that we will look at can only be done in summary form. And we're just going to touch base really quick. If you want the whole burrito, you've got to take HBI. So, um, okay. Now, I think, I'm not sure, but I hope in your notes there's a, there's some, there's a list of definitions. You might want to thumb through those to find out if they're in there. I don't have a copy of them. Yeah, I do. Let me see. They should have been added. Nope, I don't see them. And I don't have it on my slides. Okay, you come back next week, and I'll make sure you have the list of definitions, and we'll go through them then, because there are some terms that we're going to be using the next couple of weeks that I want to make sure that you understand what I mean by the terms. Um, I'll give you a couple of them just real quickly, because probably where we're going to be at, we, we, you need to know them. So what's authority? If we say the word authority, what does that mean? Authority means the power or the right to control, judge, permit, or prohibit the actions of another. That's authority. The, 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 uh, the power to control, judge, permit, or prohibit your behavior. That's authority. Autograph, I've kind of explained, give you a little bit of a quickie about that. It's the original manuscript. It's what God's writing was. Now, God didn't actually write it, but he used the men as kind of as, uh, as uh, scribes to write it down. Um, manuscript, the word manuscript, I've, I think I've mentioned that already, was a, is a, it's written with the hand. Um, uh, it's kind of like the, the autograph, but, it's a, but it's, it's a paper or a book written by hand. It's not printed. So anything that's printed is not, an, is not actually a manuscript or, an, or yeah, a manuscript. Um, and then um, text, it's a complete Old and New Testament. Let's see, where else? One more I'll give you and then we'll move on because I don't, this is, 
you don't have notes to look at, is the word Masoretic text. I'll give you two words. The Masoretic text, that's the Hebrew text. Um, it's in Hebrew, but that's the Old Testament text of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Um, the majority text is, uh, is also known as the traditional text. Um, it is the text that produced the King James Bible. The, the Greek text is called the majority text. We'll go through and explain all of those again later. Okay, well, let's go on. Um, what is the Bible? So in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, it's very simple. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst, or for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north to even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. So Amos is talking about a famine that's going to be in the land, a famine of the word. The word is missing. Uh, in a lot of people's uh, life, they don't have access, or they, they choose to, for whatever reason, choose not to have access or, or seek access to the word of God, to the Bible. So it's a famine. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, uh, says, Here... The word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there's no truth, there's no mercy, there's no knowledge of God in the land, because they have not had, a, they don't access the Bible, they don't use the correct Bible. Even if they're church people, let me just say, I'll be very blunt about this here. Sometimes people go to churches and they're preached at from a Bible that's not God's word. And so they're not getting God's word. They're, they're, there's a famine there. They're, they're missing out on it. They're not hearing it. So we talk a lot about the Bible. We use the Bible. We study the Bible. What exactly is a Bible? So I've got some interesting quotes here. I like to go back and look at some people's things, what they say about history of the Bible. Um, the Bible, first and probably most important, it's a plain person's book. The, the Bible is not a, you don't need to go to Bible college to understand the Bible. We don't, I mean, we have a Bible Institute that's kind of on the level of a Bible college, but that's because we're trying to invest men and in getting ready, men and women, getting them ready to serve at a high capacity. But that doesn't mean you have to go there. There's a lot of people that haven't gone to a Bible school, uh, but they know the Bible very well. So because it's a plain person's book, it doesn't require to, a person to be a scholar or a philosopher to understand it. You don't need Greek or Hebrew studies in order to learn the Bible. I mean, it's English. You don't need Greek and Hebrew. It's in English. And so it does not require a scholar or philosopher to understand it. John Watson, I don't remember exactly who he is, but this is a quote that he said about the Bible that is so simple that a wayfaring man or a fool need not err therein. He said this, the, I love this quote, it's as shallow enough so that the most timid swimmer may enjoy its waters without fear, and yet deep enough for the most expert swimmer to enjoy it without touching the bottom. You get what he's saying there. So the, you can wade in on the Bible and just you know, get your toes wet and still be in the Word of God and still be, have, a community, have contact with God just by wading in ankle deep, let's say. Or you can take a deep dive and go into the, like Brian does on Sunday mornings, go deep into these verses and get it out and get everything that's in there out and bring it up as a treasure, bring it to the surface. And so that quote is really awesome. It's shallow enough to most timid swimmer may enjoy its waters. The Bible is referred to as water, so that kind of fits. Yet deep enough for the most expert swimmer to enjoy it without touching the bottom. Another quote, John Cummings wrote this. He said, the empire of, the, of Caesar is gone the legions of Rome are rotting in the dust. The avalanches that Napoleon hurled at Egypt have melted away. The pride of the pharaohs has fallen. Tyre is but a rock bleaching fishermen's net. Sidon has scarcely left a wreck, to, a wreck behind, but the word of God still survives. Because nothing's going to stop the Bible. Nothing's going to stop the word of God. It's continual. It goes on. It never stops. The only way that you can stop the Bible is if you close it up, put it on your shelf, and never touch it again, and it will stop in your life. It won't stop anyplace else, but it will stop in your life if you just put it on the shelf and say, you know what, I'm done with this. I, I, and some people do that. Unfortunately, they say, you know, the pastor, he, was, he hurt my feelings, so done. Well, don't blame the pastor. 
get in the Word of God. That'll straighten it out. Okay, so anyway, all of those who have threatened to extinguish the Bible have only added to it. There's been a lot of people in history that have said that threatened to eliminate the Bible in the world. A thousand times over, the death of the Bible has been claimed by college and university professors who publish a new book or science attempts to destroy the Bible by their discoveries. I love that word discovery. You ever think about what it actually means? Discover. Something is covered. And discover means you remove the covering. And God's, when, you, when we discover something, we're discovering what God has there. Because man tried to cover it up. We lifted the cover. Oh, wow, it's God. There's evidence of God. There's proof of God. Anyway, let me go on. The French f philosopher Voltaire declared, um, declared by, the one, by 100 years after his death, the Bible, along with all Christianity, would pass into history like ancient relics. After all, the age of reason has dawned. And Voltaire died in 1778. 20 years later, the, the Geneva Bible Society turned his house into a warehouse for Bibles. <laughs> so he's, he's really happy about that. And now Thomas Paine, maybe you remember him, the American political theorist and English agnostic. This is what he said. In five years from now, there will not be a Bible in America. I have gone through the Bible with an ax and cut down all its trees. I think he's wrong. He didn't do that. He thought he, maybe in his life, but not in, not in America and not in the world. Everything that Homer, this is an interesting thing, everything that Homer had to say was preserved in 20 languages. All that Shakespeare wrote was translated into 40 languages. Tolstoy's works appear in 60 languages. How many times has the Bible been translated into different languages? Anybody know? Over 2,000 times. Over 2,000 times. There's still not en enough. There's still a lot of languages that don't have the Bible. J. Sidlow Bas uh, Baxter, which is, uh, he's, he's got some really good books that I think are good for studying. He said this, there is scarcely a sadder failure than that of a Christian who by much reading becomes more informed but less illuminated until he cannot really see into truth because, all he knows, because of all he knows around it. That's absolutely right. We, we educate ourselves right out of the Bible sometimes. The key issue on Christianity in the last days of the church, before the rapture, regarding a person's view of the Bible is the subject of the authority of the Bible. That, the word authority, as we already said, the, the, the right to basically judge, control, stop, permit, allow, whatever, uh, behaviors of another person. And that's what the Bible does. The Bible gives us direction on how to live, how to act, how to function. And if, if we don't have a Bible, we don't have that authority. God's word is always attacked, and there's a lot of emotion generated over the issue with very little clear thinking. So before we start, we need to identify some presumptions. So this is kind of getting into the study. Presum what, we have to make some presumptions here. I presume certain things about the Bible uh, that, I want, that I want you to have the same presumptions. You probably already do. Maybe you've never defined them, but this is probably where, this is where we're going to start. Because assumptions guide you to where you end up. If your assumptions are different than mine, you will end up in a different place. So mine are not special. But I just think, that, but there's, I do think they're realistic. And you'll see what I mean when I give you the first one. Three fundamental assumptions. The Bible is the mind of God for man today. That is my first assumption about the Bible. It is the mind of God for man today. If the Bible is the mind of God, then it is self-defining and self-interpreting. Maybe you've heard those expressions before. The Bible is self-defining, self-interpreting. Um, what does that mean? Well, we'll get into them later on and talk about that. We definitely get into it in, in uh, HBI. But uh, self-defining, uh, you want to know how a word is used in the Bible. The best place to go is, is according to rules of Bible study. Anybody know how to know when the, what's the rule of Bible study say about understanding how the Bible uses a word. First mention, right, first mention. Go to first mention, find out what the first time it's used, see how it's used in the context. The context will define it for you. Uh, if it is truly God's mind on matter, then it is self, not only is it self-defining and self-interpreting, it's also self-contained. We don't need another book to explain this so that we, it's self-contained, it explains itself. 
It defines its own terms by, because usage always determines meaning and it interprets itself by comparing Scripture with Scripture and cross-referencing. Number two, the second presumption that we're going to, or assumption we're going to make in this study is that the Bible is, all, all, is able to define matters of textual criticism, authority, and translations in and of itself. Now, we haven't, used, we haven't talked about t- technical or textual criticism, but we will get into that. If not, well, we'll definitely get into it when we get into the, faulty, uh, to- the, the topic on faulty text. We definitely will talk about the textual the matter. But let me just back up. I'll just give you a, just real quick, real quick, just for the sake of it. Textual criticism means that they, somebody, a scholar, has criticized the text. Well, Paul wouldn't write that way. Paul, look at how Paul wrote. So Paul couldn't have written Hebrews because Hebrews doesn't sound like uh, Galatians. And Hebrews doesn't sound like Romans. And Hebrews doesn't sound like uh, Ephesians or Philippians or anything. So he, he's, he couldn't have written that. They're basing it on their opinion of the text. That couldn't have been by Paul. Paul would never have wrote, wrote that way. He wouldn't have used those words. It's kind of a literary uh, critique, but the issue is is it is textual criticism. They they criticize the text, but the Bible defines itself. We don't need those guys. Um, Let's see. We're still on number two. I think so. Yeah. So what the Bible says about itself, about the process of the word of God arriving on this planet, about the instances of preservation and translation, these things can all be read back into human history to define for us what God has done. We can see what God has done when we look back in history and see how he moved in people's lives in history and see what they did so we know how God took care of his word. The Bible defines this issue for us just like it defines any other issue of life. Um, And I think in the third one here, we do not need, um, we do not need to resort to opinions of people in order to find out what the God allowed to happen in his word. One of the things that I don't think you hear, Brian, or, and I, I rarely do it myself. I don't think Jeff does it either. I don't need other pastors that do it. Well, so-and-so says this is what the Bible means. You don't hear us quoting scholars. We quote the Bible. And we might say, I think what this means is, I've been trying to figure it out, and I think this is where it is, and this is why I think that. We might say that, but we will never say, well, we don't give support to the, to the scholars in the world. Um, you don't do that, do you, Jeff? I'm going to call him out on the carpet. As the authority on the scripture. Okay. That's what I'm referring to. Okay. So we had three assumptions, but we also have what I call three critical sources for our assumptions. Um, so these are critical sources that help our assumptions be valid. First is that the evidence provided in the scripture. So we look at the scripture, we know everything that we just said, done saying about the, the assumptions. Number two, the, the evidence provided for the existing manuscripts. And we'll talk about manuscripts. And, and when I say we have over 5,000 pieces of existing manuscripts that prove out that the Bible we have today is what the Bible was then. And so we'll look at that. And then number three is the, uh, the observing God's hand in history. Um, God is always moving in history. He uses history and he controls history as he needs to. But he's moving in history and we can see his hand. Okay, so how are we going to approach all of this stuff? How are we going to come at this? What are we going to try to get accomplished? Um, so the method of approach... Don't approach this as, as a scholar of the original languages. Because uh, um, we just, we don't need to do that. This is not, this issue is not settled on the basis of scholarship. We're not looking for scholars to tell us what the Bible is and is not. Scholars and critics are not the ones who are allowed to draw the final conclusions on this matter. And the role of a scholar is, is to try to determine the words of the Bible on the basis of, critic, of a critic of the text either the words. So textual criticism is criticizing the words. The other type of criticism that's out there is called form criticism, where uh, when you look at, like in the, in, in, in the book of Psalms, for example, much of the book of Psalms is, is, is either in a song form or a poem. Uh, so that would be a form. And so we would evaluate, the form critics would evaluate the Bible and what kind of form is it. And Paul would never write a song. 
So it can't be Paul. That kind of stuff. That would be form criticism. We don't want to approach this as textual or form as a critic, and we do and we do want to approach the sub the subject primarily as investigators of truth. So when you come at the Bible, you need to approach the Bible. I'm in, I'm here to investigate what God has said, what God is what is true about the Bible, what is true about what God said, what is true about God. That's what I, that's how we should invest uh, approach the Bible, and we should we should learn uh, intellectual and theor- and technical things about the text with the goal of enabling you to feel comfortable um, discussing technical things. Sometimes you have to talk about technical things because you get challenged and you need to understand them. I mean, people like to challenge you all the time. If you you are a believer in the Bible, in particular the King James Bible, you may have to defend your position in the King James Bible even against with another Christian. Why do, you, why do you use the King James Bible? Everybody knows that's ancient, ancient English. Nobody talks like that anymore. Why do you use that? We'll talk about some of the criticisms that people have about the King James Bible. And I'm sure you've heard them. And I'm sure you've probably had to try to answer some. How do you, you know, how do you, you know, what are the these and the thous and all that kind of stuff? Well, there's a reason for that. And so anyway, um, sometimes you need to know the technical things. There are some questions as well. Um, along with these fundamental assumptions and the method of approach and the critical sources of, as we come at it, there are some critical questions that need to be answered. They're some of the most basic and fundamental questions that Christians can have, yet they're also the most important questions about the Bible because these issues are literally the glue that holds Christianity together when it comes to the Bible. So here's the, here's the questions. What is the Word of God? How do you answer the question, what is the Word of God? When you use that phrase, what does that mean? Where can you find the Word of God? Is it this book, or is it an NIV, or is it ESV, or is it 75 other different versions of the Bible? Which one is it? There, it can't be all of them. Why can't it be all of them? That's another question. Why can't it be all of them? Because they don't all say the same thing. Why don't they say the same thing? Because critics got in the, got in the mix, and they messed up the, art, the, the, the text. Is it available to me in my language? That's a good question to ask. I think everybody in here speaks English. But imagine if you were to speak Swahili. Can you get a Bible in Swahili? Can you get a Bible in French? Can you get a Bible in Spanish? Can you get a Bible in, in uh, uh, Lamba, which is an a African tribe? Can you get the Bible in what languages can? So if somebody's looking for a Bible, do they have access to the Word of God? Part of the reason that we do what we do with Word First Publishing is to try to help people get the Bible in the language that they need to be able to, what we call the heart language. So your heart language generally is English. Somebody who is a, speaks Spanish, grew up in a Spanish culture, and that's all they ever spoke, their heart language is Spanish. And so we want to make sure people can get the Bible in their language. Another question is, are the differences in translations and versions important? Are there differences in this version versus this version? And do, those, do they really make a difference? And the answer is yes, they do make a difference. Literally, they'll change the doctrine of what you believe about the Bible. And things that are, that are preached to you here or taught to you here throughout the week uh, wouldn't stand through another version of the Bible because the words won't be there. They'll be different. And so the last question is, well, what Bible is the Word of God? What Bible is the Word of God? I think it's the King James Bible. That's why we use the King James Bible here at this church, because as a church, we've taken the stand or the position because of our studies that this is the right Bible to use. This is the text to use. Okay. So there's some key issues that I want to talk about. So we've got three assumptions uh, three critical sources, we've got some methods, we've got some critical questions, and then lastly, we're going to wrap up here with some cr- key, key issues. Just like there's fundamental assumptions and all of those, there are three key issues that have a clear, that, that have, we have to be clear on these, uh, these assumptions or these issues. The word authority, the word accuracy, and the word availability. Um, let's see, here we go. Authority, accuracy, and availability. So does your God, under authority, does your God have the ability to inspire his word through men without error? So 
Can, does God have the ability, the authority to give his word to a, a scribe, like somebody that wrote, the, wrote a section of the Bible, give it to them without error? You know, God trusted a human being. This is also an argument against any of the Bibles. Well, it was God, man wrote the Bible. That was one of the arguments I had when I first, before I got saved. Well, there's how these men wrote the Bible. You know, men, are make, men make mistakes all the time. So the issue is authority. God has the ability to do that. Does your God have the ability to preserve the word that he has inspired? So he inspired it, had it written. Now, so from Moses to you, from Paul to you, from David to you, from Job to you, is Job being the oldest book of the Bible, can, is, is it um, preserved from the way it was written 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years to Christ, and almost a couple of thousand years back to Job, can that still be preserved to you actually reading what Job wrote? How do you feel about that? Do you, do you think that that's a true statement? Do you actually believe that? Or you say, well, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. That's what this is about right now. Do you have, does God, in your, in your view, in your assumptions, in your, in your approaches and so on, does God have the ability to preserve his word from when it was inspired, when it was written, when it was inscripturated? Does your God have the ability to preserve it? Does your God have the ability to give you his word in your language in such a way that it is authoritative? Uh, I mean, a lot of people look at the Bible and say, I, I don't agree with that. And they, they know the words, they know what it means, but they don't agree. They, they basically say, it's not, I'm not under that authority. So the issue of authority of the Bible is critical to submission, to obedience to God. Not only that, but if your Bible is not authoritative, then you will not be able to preach authoritatively, and you will never get anything done in, God, in, in your life or anybody else's life. You'll never see the word move in their life. Because authority is important where you stand. And the second thing was, as I have on the screen, is a th accuracy. Is it enough to simply have the thoughts of God? How, do, we, do we have his thoughts or do we have his words? That is, again, a challenge against the Bible. Well, these are God's thoughts. This is what he was thinking when he had this guy write this stuff. So it's just what he was thinking. It wasn't what he said. How do we know the difference? And we'll talk about that in the next couple of days, uh, next couple of weeks anyway. So is it simply, is it enough to simply have his thoughts? Or do we also need to have the very words that the Holy Spirit intended us to have? Is inspiration verbal? Did God say things or just say thoughts? How do you say thoughts without saying things? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> How do you say, I mean, just think about it. Say a thought. Just say a thought. I think nobody can say that thought. I think nobody can say that thought because I don't think anybody can. You have to say words to convey your thoughts. Right? Okay, I think I make a point there. Okay, so how accurate do we have to be in a translation before we can say we have the Word of God? Can, okay, so in this Bible, the King James Bible, I don't know exactly how many words, 87,000, something like that. There's a lot of words. Let's just use that number for right now, 87,000. What if it was 77,000 were right and 10,000 were wrong? Would this, make a, would this be an authoritative book in your life? Absolutely not. So we need to have 100% accuracy. Accuracy is very important. How accurate do we have to be? before we can say that we have God's word. So if, if, if we want this book to be accurate, wouldn't we want any other version to have the same accuracy? You know they don't. You know there are versions that people use, pastors preach that out of every Sunday, that are missing versions, missing verses. They're literally missing verses. Not just a word, but a verse. A whole verse is gone. The number doesn't exist. Which that really, when I found that, when I, shortly after I got saved and I'm studying this stuff out, I'm like, it goes from verse, I can't remember, I'll just give you an example. It goes from verse 7, 8, 9, 11, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then the chapter ends. What am I missing? That's where I at. And then so availability would be that point there. 
If the words are the key to the Bible, then where do we go in the English language to find God's words? Where do we go? So we got about 20 minutes, and I got a little bit faster than I thought. But that's okay. Any questions on anything so far? You need to be clarified with some of the things that I said. Okay, I guess not. That's good. I guess that means you're on your tracking. Okay, so let's talk about preservation then. Let's see if I can jump over here. Yeah. Got. So, did you say that the Bible is anthology or not? It's not. It's not because, let me back up to my notes here. I kind of butchered that area up a little bit, but let me make sure that I clarify it the best I can. So I gave the definition of an anthology as a book or a collection of writings by various authors, usually in the same literary form. And so the first thing is the same literary form. So the Bible, throughout the Bible, has different form in it. Some are poems, some are history, some are um, prophetic, and so on. So those are different uh, literary forms. They're not of the same period because Moses didn't write in the same period that, that Paul wrote. So it's different, that's a different period. So that, so that doesn't qualify for it. And they all didn't write on the same subject. The Old Testament writers uh, wrote, some of it was history. Some of it was uh, poetic, like Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and so on, uh, Proverbs and, and Psalms. And then some of it was prophetic. Uh, so... Um, so they didn't write about the same subject. So it's not an anthology by, de by definition of an anthology. The Bible is not that. Any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about preservation because this is the key thing about the whole conversation that we're really having is because God preserved the word of God. And, uh, um, okay. So... See, the reason that the modern lukewarm Laodicean church are no longer Philadelphia, and you guys are, I hope, familiar with the difference between the Laodicean church, which is the time period that we're in today, and the Philadelphian church, which the Philadelphian church um, started around 1650 up to about 1800, uh, 1880 time frame, and then we went into Laodicean church where all the church got lazy, and um, uh, they were more concerned about themselves than anything else. Whereas the Philadelphian church, Philadelphian church historically sent more missionaries than any other church period. And, uh, and so the Laodicean church is very lukewarm as Jesus Christ defined the church, Laodicean church in Revelation chapter two and three. Uh, the Philadelphian, so they're, they're no longer the Philadelphian church because they strictly, I don't know if you can see that out there, but have not kept God's word. They have not kept God's word. In Revelation 3, 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept thy word, kept my word, and hast not denied my name. That's the Philadelphian church. And in Rome, Re Revelation 3, 10 and 11, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall keep thee upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast from which, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man can take thy crown. So as a definition, um, as a definition, to keep God's word means to guard it from corruption. So when he says, when Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says, to keep my, yes, kept my word, or in verse 10 and 11, thou hast kept the word of my patience. To keep God's word means to guard it from corruption, guard it from loss, and guard it from injury by keeping your eye on it. About, uh, and also translated the word preserve is the same thing, to keep, to, pr to protect it. That's what it means to preserve. The Philadelphian church stopped keeping the word of God by the late 1880s. Which, by the way, in the 1880s, so we had a King James Bible from 1611 up until the 1880s. And then the revised uh, Bible, the RSV, or RV, the revised version, was, was launched out onto the world in the 1880s. Um, and, uh, and then, so 20 years before that was in, in Europe, and, and in the 1880s was in the United States. Today, we have a world that is floundering without an anchor because of that. And we gave our task 
This is where I look at things. We gave the task of the church. The church was supposed to keep the word. That's what Jesus Christ just got done saying. Where's the church should keep the word, protect the word, preserve the word. Why we have a Bible pr um, printing ministry in this church is so we can literally hold that truth to our hearts. We, we do this so that we are preserving the word. We want to make sure the word is transmitted as much as possible, but it preserved as well. So this is what happened. We gave our task, the church task, we gave the task to the publishers and the printers who now hold the word of God hostage. You ever think about that? The word of God is held hostage by the printing press of the, of, uh, I can't even think of all of the printing companies right now that do a Bible. Um, but Nelson, yeah, Nelson Bible, Holman, Zondervan, you get the point. But here's the thing. They have held the word hostage, and you only get what, they, you, what, what you pay for. With, um, you only get it when you pay for it with royalties and license fees, but you also get what they want you to have, not what God wanted you to have. Because they define how the Bible should print. These printing companies are producing new Bibles every year. Not necessarily new text, but they will reformat it, change it, and put it in a different, uh, different cover and sell it as a new Bible. But they sometimes will, will change the Bible itself. So we have not, the church has not guarded the Bible. And because we have not kept the word of his patience, we have not kept the word from, we have not, we ha, we have not been kept from the hour of temptation either. Because we allowed too many versions of the Bible out there. And it's a shame. It really is a shame that we shouldn't have allowed that to happen. We should never have allowed no, I mean, I say we, I'm talking about the church, historically the church, going back to 1880. The church, that, that, that should never have happened. We should never allow the printing companies to, to print a Bible. Churches, that's the problem. Churches can't print Bibles. But there are a few churches in the United States, there's probably about a half a dozen or maybe eight or ten, that, that have a printing press and print Bibles all the time, and they print them in as many languages as they can. And they're all based on the same text as the King James Bible. And, I mean, there are some probably out there. I don't think any churches. Well, first off, the King James Bible is the only Bible that's not copyrighted. So we can do this, what we're doing, and we're not violating copyright. You, we couldn't print a new, King, a, new, a new international version. We couldn't print an ESV because we don't have the copyright permission to do that. They would never let us do it. Why? Because we're giving it away for free. They want the money for it. And so we have to, you know, the church should never have given that to the printing sh print houses. It's unfortunate, but that's what happened. And then the print houses, because they had the, the investment of the equipment, they could print. Uh, you know, one of the first things that was ever printed on a printing press was a Bible. Uh, Gutenberg's first printing press, he printed, he printed uh, God's Word on, the, on that press. And that's the way it's fine that that happened, but we should never have printed different versions of the Bible. Anyway, um, next point is uh, scholarship does not give us really any comfort when we think about all of that. And I want to say this about scholars and scholarship real quick because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit scholars pretty hard, uh, and I definitely do in, in the HBI class. I hit them pretty hard. Now, there are good and there are bad scholars. I mean, there are, I mean you, need, you need scholarship on both sides sometimes, but there's good and there's bad on both sides. But the point is, the point of addressing scholarship as being guilty of taking our Bibles in the study of preservation is because the practice is established by secular scholarship. What happened was in, in universities and colleges, they created a method of, of studying all kinds of things, history and math and social sciences and different kind of things. And then the scholars in the Bible said, you know what, we need to match what they're doing. And they wanted to match it in their, in, within a scholarship mindset. And then they, uh, they applied the same kind of scholarship rules that they were using for mathematics and, and um, science and different things. And they applied it to Bible and it just messed things up. Because you can't, you can't do it that way. You have to let the Bible define itself. So the Holy Spirit has been isolated or fully eliminated. And the result is a rejection of God's hand in the process of the... And, and an elevation of the evidence through purely scientific and academic models. For, in order to validate the Bible, we're, we're, we, 
it's not, the Bible today is not validated unless scholarship says that's the Bible. How many would you like to have come in and take your Bible away because they, they say the King James Bible is not a valid Bible. You guys are no longer allowed to use the King James Bible. Would you give your Bible up? I wouldn't. But that can't happen because that's what um, I think is, we might be seeing that soon. Anyway, from the time of the Victorian era in the first half of the 1800s, sweeping liberalism and apostasy made its way into the evangelical church through outsourcing the Bible disciplines to non-evangelical non-believers and letting them print. This outsourcing um, of the biblical examination began around the late 19th century when German scholars Johann Griesbeck and Johann Bingel, that's those two guys there, um, they spurred modern textual critical theory by re-examining the Textus Receptus, which is the basis of the King James Bible, and entered into a number of scientific criteria for determining authentic New Testament readings. They basically took, took the process of doing math and science evidence and stuff, and they said, these two guys said, let's do that to the Bible, and they made a mess of everything. Um, Griesbeck is... is, is uh, uh, credited with originating the term synoptic gospel. You know what the synoptic gospel is? That's a comparison of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and also, he published the first critical edition of the New Testament in 1775. So not too long after the King James Bible. Later, these two men, later two other men named... Uh, um, Brooke Westcott and Fenton Hort so we know them as Westcott and Hort, they adopted the same method and produced a Greek text in 1881 that eventually became the foundation of the current New Nestle Allen Greek text that modern versions of the Bible use to translate their Bibles into English. This is the text that the United Bible Society uses today. Okay, so we're probably going to get too far away, so I'm going to, just, I'm going to say this and then we'll end and let you just fester on all of this stuff. So these guys, Johann uh, Griesbeck and Johann Bengel and uh, Westcott and Hort, they basically, they, they ended up, want two, the first two guys started it and the second two guys finished it. And they created a, a Greek text that the Bible, like, for the, like the NIV and the ESV and other Bibles, used that Greek text to, to translate into English to give you those English Bibles. The King James Bible was based on what we call the Textus Receptus, commonly referred to as the TR, the Textus Receptus. And, and the Greek Bible, the Greek text, translated into the King James Bible. So we have that. So they, they, they said to the, to the TR, move it out of the way, let's bring in this new one we call the United Bible Society text, and that's what we'll translate from now on. What they did was they changed words that the TR had like, for example, the blood of Christ, in many verses, the blood is not in the verse anymore in those current uh, non-textual non Bibles. We'll talk more about that next week. But let me just kind of give you a real quick uh, um, little, uh, resume, I guess, of Westcott and Hort. So I hope you can read all of that. It's pretty small text, isn't it? Anyway, Westcott denied the historical accuracy of Genesis. He denied the atonement of Jesus Christ. He believed in water sprinkled for regeneration. He believed in a universal fatherhood. He did not believe in the devil as a person. He believed water baptism regenerated Christ as it will regenerate you. He believed that heaven was a state, not a place. He did not believe, he did not believe that Christ was literally returning. He did not believe in Christ's deity. He taught that Christ reached perfect perfection after his death. He worshiped Mary. He believed in the theory of evolution. And that's the guy that gave us the, what we currently use today as a Greek text to translate all the English Bibles. And I wouldn't say not just English, but even foreign Bibles, other language Bibles. Because you take the Greek and then you translate it into whatever languages you're looking for. Hort... He, now, he was, he was a professor and a vicar. 
I think that's a religious position. Anyway, he believed in the theory of evolution. He denied Eden existed. He denied that Paul saw the Lord. He believed that Christ came, th Christ, oh, I'm sorry, he believed that the church became the true Israel. That's replacement theology. He denied the second coming of Christ, and he believed that worshiping Mary was the same as worshiping Jesus. Those are the guys that we can thank for giving us the conflict of the different versions of the Bible that we have today. When you go to any Christian bookstore and try to buy a Bible, if you're lucky, you can find some King James Bibles, but you'll find a lot of different versions in there. Okay, so I'm going to pause at this point. We've got about five minutes. Any other questions on anything? If not, we'll just call it, not, we'll call it done here. Yes? I'll have to look that up specifically. I just put it, I, I got the list on him. I don't actually at the moment don't, you know, I'll, 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 I'll answer that next week. Jeff, you got an answer? Yes. We're all the He is the creator of Okay, does everybody get that? He's not the father of all. He's only the father of those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, according to John chapter 1 and verse 12. Thank you for uh, hitting the right, the right answer real easy. Yeah. And Peter, okay, basically what Jeff said was like an, as, a, as an illustration in Discipleship 1, Lesson 1, when you're talking about the, the, the nature of, of sin, salvation, the need, need to be saved. We, we define two fathers in, in, uh, in the lesson. And actually in John chapter, chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus Christ tells, that the, tells the, uh, the Pharisees that their father is the devil. And so universal fatherhood um, is a, a belief that everybody's a child of God, regardless of their salvation condition, which is a false teaching. Would that be basically a summary? Okay. So, and if you remember in John chapter 8, what Jesus Christ is, is, is calling the Pharisees out on the carpet, and he says, You're, you are your father, the devil, and, and uh, you know, they get all irated with him about that. Uh, but that's the issue. Uh, so the, the lesson in D1 teaches you are, uh, you are in the devil's family until you get saved, and once you get saved, then you are adopted into the Father, as in, into God's family, and now He is your Father. He, God is not your Father when you're not in His family, and the only way you get in His family is to be saved. Okay, good question, good catch. Okay, anything else? Okay, so I know next week we'll be on here, and then the week after, and then I'm not sure what we'll do the third week, but I um, will. We'll, we'll uh, move as long as, as it takes. So they give me four weeks, but I don't know if I'm going to. It might take a little less. might take a little bit more. We'll see. All right. Well, let's pray, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this, uh, this study. Thank you for the questions that we've had. Thank you for the, uh, the thinking that we're all subjected to now, Lord. Just exactly where is your word? Where can we find it? Do we have a, a reliability uh, on it, Lord. Can we, can we believe that it is your word and we can trust it and we can obey it, Lord, knowing that it is um, in an authority in our life and it's accurate. And we just thank you for that. And we pray, Father, for, uh, again, everybody on the prayer list, that so we just mention those again one more time, Lord, just you would just move in their life and you would, rec and you would show yourself mighty in, uh, in the needs that they're there. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.